That's a taste of some good stuff they're going to get next term. Did you know Mike Matz is joining me in this class next term? Hey! Some team, huh? Beauty, Beauty and the Beast? <laughs> uh, I think I talked myself into something there, didn't I? Our Father, we thank you for this time that we can have together. We pray that our hearts will be melded together in love. We pray, Lord, that love will cover a multitude of mistakes and problems as we continue to cover this difficult subject. We pray that as a result of our coming together today, we'll be more productive servants, more insightful servants. But Lord, not just in ministering to others, we pray that you'll minister to us, balance us out, help us to be whole and entire, particularly in this area that's so much on the minds of people in our society. Help us to be grateful for how you made us. Help us to not be antsy and tight about the subject of sex. If anybody should be whole and wholesome, it's your people. Amen. If anybody ought to be relaxed about the subject of sex, it ought to be your people. Because we walk in order and we're holy unto thee as you've required us to be, as you work in us to be. And we are thankful, Father, that you've made us the way you've made us and that we can realize our full potential. Now help us to understand it better for our own advantage in Christ and then so that we can minister grace to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, first I'd like to just make a quick correction. Some brethren felt that uh, my wife uh, leading the pack, that possibly I led a misunderstanding about this business of masturbation, uh, suggesting that the mechanics alone don't make it a sin, is what you think. Now, you see, my standard is the Word, and there's nothing in the Word that does suggest anything other than that. And we heap on ourselves guilt unnecessarily sometimes, and ignore guilt when necessarily we should sometimes, because the evil one, the deceiver, does it to us. Now, a little kid that's a little baby that hasn't learned yet and uh, that gets all horny when he plays with himself and, 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 and does that is not a wicked little sex-perverted beast, okay? And that mechanical manipulation is not a sin. And you heard me say the other day that I don't believe it's possible for an adult to manipulate himself without having thoughts. Now, the only exception to that would be possibly when you're um, asleep or half asleep at night and you have the wet dream, you know, the equivalent. Men and women can have that. That's a possible exception. But it's how you think in your heart that makes masturbation sinful. And I don't know an adult who can manipulate himself and uh, not think evil thoughts. I've never had one tell me you could do it yet. And so I don't suggest it. I don't recommend it. And I don't mean to suggest that you ought to experiment and try it out to find out if you can. But uh, the word does not address itself to it except uh, Matthew 5, 27 and 28. Let's look at that real quick. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. Just to make sure we do understand the closest thing that I can see that comes to dealing with the business of masturbation. I'm reading from the Amplified. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who so much as looks at a woman with evil desire for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay? And so I think to say, I would if I could. I think to say, I would if I could, whether or not you have someone there, even if it's just a fantasy, is saying in your heart, I would commit adultery. I would if I could. Even if you're not saying, I would if I could commit adultery, but if the relationship is not a marriage relationship that you have, and you're saying, I would if I could, I just submit to you that it would seem to me at least to be adultery. I cannot masturbate. Now, the mechanics would not be, would not keep me from masturbating, but my mind has to fantasize to be able to elicit the kind of orgasm that one masturbates for. So I just submit to you that uh, it's adultery of heart that would be precipitated by masturbation. Now, if you, if you, uh, are thoroughly persuaded some other way in your own heart and mind to the Lord, you stand or fall. But before you commend it to someone else, remember that I have never in my years of pastoral ministry and counseling ministry, I've never come across an adult who can say, I can just 
physically manipulate myself without mental images. Okay? The only exception to that would be a wet dream uh, for fellows or at night, you know, when you're stimulated and you haven't even thought anything. You don't know why you're stimulated and, and, and you uh, end up, end up a, uh, 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 coming to an orgasm at night without, without the thought. That's the only exception I've, I've heard of, and that's involuntary. Largely. Any questions or comments about that? Because I want to put it to I want to put it to rest. I don't want to uh, uh, to wrestle with it. I am not in any way commending masturbation. Now Charlie Shedd, if you've read anything he re he's put out, does he recommends it? Thinks it's a wonderful thing. But I just don't think it can be because of the mental images that you construct in your heart. And then of course the puritanical view is that anything that is that uh, st that that stimulates uh, sexually outside of a marriage. Uh, outside the marriage bed has to be wrong, but that is reading into scripture. Somebody says, "Well, God made it. God made sex for uh, uh, just for marriage." And uh, the fact of the matter is, He made you a body, and uh, uh, there are some things that uh, that uh, I think we, there is room for for some liberty, and uh, where we can be thoroughly persuaded in our own mind. If that's your conviction, that you cannot have any kind of a sexual experience apart from your marriage partner, then I think you should live by it. Um, uh, I can't think of many that I could have apart from my marriage partner. I can't think of any either. But again, we ought not to impose our convictions on other people. We can only say what the Word says and then commend a way of life. Okay, now very quickly I want to move with you another, a number of other principles. And again, my brethren, forbear me if I have not said what your conviction is or if I've stepped on your toes. Be thoroughly persuaded in your own heart and mind. I just wanted to briefly cover that business on masturbation. I don't tell somebody he automatically that he's sinning because he masturbates. I point to the fact that he is saying in his heart something as he mechanically or as she mechanically masturbates. Are you hearing me? It's not the mechanical activity, it's the thought that makes it sin according to God's Word. Otherwise the Word doesn't address itself. If the Word doesn't address itself to it that way, then I think, and, and, and it's been around a long time since man has, be, uh, has begun, I'm convinced, the capacity to masturbate. I'm convinced the Word would address itself to the practice if it were important to address itself to the practice. God not, is no dummy. And I think he addresses it himself rather to our hard attitude and what the mind is working on and not the physical activity. And that takes the pressure off your little brat as he grows up, okay, until you can help him to understand that uh, self-stimulation is not appropriate, at least uh, around other people. And as he gets older, uh, I think that... Uh, uh, children will come to realize the the, the, the sexual experiences associated uh, with sex and uh, without too much difficulty will stop um, uh, playing with himself uh, just by virtue of the fact that he becomes socialized. Okay, Not because it is in and of itself ipso facto sin. Scripture doesn't say that. And if you have insight from God's Word that I don't see, please show me. Okay, It's where our heart is. Are you, are you, are you hearing me? Don't heap guilt on little ones, okay? Don't heap guilt on them. I mean, there's enough reason to feel guilty for not measuring up without having to, to carry that. And if their hearts are for the Lord, and that's what the important thing is, uh, they'll not do anything that's displeasing to Him. Isn't that right? Just like you'll not. And when there's a question, I don't want to err on the side of care. I want to make sure I don't do anything that would be displeasing to the Lord. So let's promote that, and not don'ts. So let's promote do's. Do have a heart for the Lord, and that'll take care of a lot of the should not. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's a matter of emphasis. I don't say that we ought to always just go around talking about the positive. There are some negatives in life, but um, that I think we can approach that way. Okay, there are 47 times in the New Testament fornication is mentioned. 47 times. It's a major theme. And the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 3 and 4 that we're to be careful not only in our performance but also in our discussions, in the way we talk. Ephesians 5, verses 3 and 4 say this, But immorality, sexual vice, and all impurity of lustful, rich, wasteful living, or greediness, must, must not even be named among you, as is fitting and proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, obscenity, indecency, nor foolish and sinful talk, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting or becoming, but instead voice your thankfulness to God. There is that which is unseemly. This is an appropriate place, I believe, to talk about this topic. Uh, I, I know there are some of you who think that this is not even an appropriate place. But if you don't talk about it here, 
in a counseling class where you're going to be dealing with problems uh, not unlike this the rest of your life, where will you talk about it? Where will you come to grips with it? But casual talk, joking about sensuous things, I don't think is appropriate. So there needs to be, in the people of God, a capacity to be embarrassed appropriately. We ought not to be so desensitized to the inappropriate behaviors of the world, to sinful performances, that we don't get embarrassed. Now, I feel I'm appropriately desensitized. There's not much I haven't come across in my counseling and pastoral ministries. But I still feel that some things are unseemly. And it still takes discipline to be able to deal with it. So I hope God will give us an appropriate embarrassment without being prudish. Does that make sense? And only the Spirit of the Lord can give us the balance. When somebody comes to me and he tells me he's been involved with a horse or a calf, that's happened. Farm boy tells me he's been involved sexually with a calf. Playing around. I should be embarrassed appropriately, right? But not so much that I fall off my chair or can't handle the whole thing and, and, and can't relate to the person. And brethren, there'll be more and more perversion as time goes on. Men with men, women with women, and other things that we ought always to be embarrassed about but never so sensitive that we can't deal with them and love the sinner while we hate the sin. Okay? God will have to give us that balance and I can't take too much more time on it. Okay, now one more reference to masturbation. It was never mentioned in the scriptures. In cha chapter 38 of Genesis, uh, the sin of Onan uh, was, was thought to be by some to be the sin of masturbation because he let a semen fall on the ground. And that is not, you have to read that in the scripture. And my brethren, I think we ought to focus on where the Lord focuses. Onan's sin was to disobey God by not taking his brother's wife to himself as a law of God it was established. That was his sin. And it got complicated by some other things, but, but uh, the, the masturbation is not spoken of there as being sinful in and of itself. The act of masturbation is not what makes it sinful. It's the thoughts that are associated with self-stimulation that make it sinful. That's what I think God's Word teaches, and that's what I think we have to go with. I've had mentally disturbed people in my home. I've ministered to them. Some of the mentally disturbed have difficulty. Some of them are profoundly disturbed. IQs, I have tested a young man, 20 years old, to over, over 20 years old, who I think had an IQ of, of 23. Another one, I had an IQ of 46. Okay, now average IQ, you know, is, is 90 to 110. These are people who are really, really low. And they do some things that are rascally, you know, it feels good, they really do it. Okay, and, and the important thing to teach these people, uh, I think, is the, the, the appropriateness of some of their behavior. Are they... Are they, are they gross, heinous sinners because they are self-stimulating? I think not. And I just submit that there are some exceptions. And, and little children and the retarded, uh, I think, can help you appreciate that the, the, the physical act is not what makes it sin, in my, is my understanding. It's what you think as you do it. And I have never yet come across an adult who can think pure thoughts while, self, while stimulating himself sexually. Okay? For what it's worth, if you're, if you're that exception, um, to the Lord you stand or fall. But we just want to leave that behind and move on. Now, I think it's important to understand that in our environment today, we have to deal with sex all the time because everything's sold by sex today with some rare exceptions. Isn't that true? Even toothpaste? Okay, well, it's a sexually supercharged environment. It's a sexually supercharged environment. And as a result, um, uh, there is a, a peer pressure by everybody around us in the world to just accept the uh, inordinate pressures to, to um, uh, look at sex commonly. Now, sex is wonderful, and the scripture says it is undefiled, the bed is undefiled in God's pattern. But brethren, we've got a, we've got a perverted nation. And I believe with, with Davy Wilkerson, there's a baptism of filth that has been instituted in America. And every time I turn around, I see bonds. And I have come across Christian after Christian couples that really believe they get married because they have the quiver in their being toward the other person. And nowhere in God's word is the need for eros, bod to bod attraction, a prerequisite for marriage. But most kids... And I do think this campus is not an exception. 
Most young people look for good looks, eros, before anything else. And if they don't have the chemistry, the bod, the bod attraction, somebody's disqualified automatically. And I'm telling you, and you've heard me say before, the easiest adjustment for you to make is a sexual adjustment. You can marry a dog in looks who has a heart for Jesus and have a good sexual relationship. That is not going to keep you from having it. I'm telling you. The easiest adjustment is sexual. But you find somebody who doesn't have a heart for Jesus, and I guarantee you problems the rest of your life. So we have a sexually supercharged environment that keeps us continually sensitive to sexual things and peer pressure. Everybody around us seems to just accept it and kind of flow with it. And I think it, uh, we ought to always be uh, uh, capable of, 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 of embarrassment for a, a billboard with a naked woman on it, short of a bikini. That always ought to distract us. We have to always be able to say that's inappropriate, even though we don't get all, I don't think we ought to get all puritanical and say, you know, the world's going to hell in a basket and that type of thing. But we have to be aware that that is wrong. That's inappropriate. Okay, another thing that adds to our sexual distraction is, is the fact that sex is very convenient these days. I want you to put some of these things down. Environment, sexually overcharged, okay? Put down in your, in your notes. I want you to be appreciative of this fact. Uh, ease of, of uh, acquiring contraceptives. Kids can get it today without their parents' permission while they're in high school. Did you know that? It's dispensed freely in some states. Plus, our kids, as well as everybody else, have mobility. They got the car. You got the car, there ain't nothing you can't do in a car. Kids have been doing knowing that for years. They got cash. And go anywhere. They can rent a motel. They don't want to do it in the car. And they do it. And it's easy. And your kids, when they grow up in a public school, especially, and not just a public school, but you know, you're not that far away from the school system that you grew up in. It's done regularly, isn't it? And it's the end thing. Convenient sex. I'll tell you something else. There are very, very few restraints at home. Mom and dad don't watch the kids like they used to. You know? And my girls are going to have chaperones. My girl, I'll trust them. You bet I'll trust them, but it'll be inappropriate for them to be alone with a fella. I want them to grow up knowing that. Why? Not because I don't trust them, but why lead yourself into temptation? You get alone with the opposite sex for very long and you're friendly, you're going to take liberties before too terribly long just because you're friendly, because you like each other, and also because you're a sexual being if you like each other enough. Convenient sex. Fewer restraints at home or elsewhere, anywhere. We have changing values. I'm going to re, re, uh, re, re mimeo that uh, book, that little thing I put out. Uh, is everything relative? That there is a view today, even in churches. Disciples of Christ is where I worked for a while. Uh, but there is a view today that as long as you love, as long as you care about somebody, anything goes. And it prevails. And uh, there are a lot of values today where... I think the young people of today are actually more are more conservative than their parents. At Wheaton Academy, where I was headmaster, uh, I was trying to help the gals. Uh, we had a dress problem. And it was the days of miniskirts. I'm an old man, so this is when miniskirts were in. And I was suggesting that the men were um, uh, ought to be given some, some consideration by the gals. So we had a two-day seminar. I brought my big old six-foot-five director of, athletes, of athletics in, and and I had a, a visiting woman nurse who was really classy, who knew how to relate to the gals. And so I had somebody who could relate to the fellows, somebody who could relate to the gals. Gave them the facts of life with the mamas being there. All the kids' parents were there, those who could come. It was evening as well as day. And you know what I found out? The kids flowed. The kids says, man, that's right. And then the girls understood, understood better how fellows were made. And the fellows understood better why they were responding the way they were. Man, there was a spirit of revival on the kids. But the mothers were up in arms. They were more liberal than the kids. I think kids can see it. I think that's one of the reasons why revival comes usually through young people, often first. But the mothers were giving us a real hard time, saying we have no business imposing our value system on their children. The children had already flowed into it. And saying, what do you expect me to do, go out and buy a whole new wardrobe? And, you know, it was really a problem. There are changing values, and our parents get affected. And so will you. But that affects our sexual tendency to be promiscuous in attitude, to be a little more open than we ought to be. 
We get inappropriate education. We got sex education in our schools now. I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, if I got told how it all happened, and I didn't know until I was just about out of high school, I was that naive, I had no reason to know. I was busy with physics club and all other kinds of chemistry club and student council and my youth work was going strong at church and I didn't have time to do anything that would uh, make me want to get involved sexually. But uh, today our kids learn how it's all done without a value system attached. They get the facts without a value system. That's what's wrong with sex education. Education by itself is not wrong. But without a value system attached to it, all you learn is how, and you get stimulated. How many remember what it was like to be an adolescent? Are you that far removed from being an adolescent? I mean, you get hot and bothered just because you're an adolescent. Isn't that true? I could tell you some stories. Whew. You get hot and bothered just by virtue of the fact that you're adolescent. Your glands are changing, and they're really working. Of course, you get it all the time on TV. We get enculturated. Another thing that enc encourages promiscuity, a uh, wrong attitude about sex, is, is uh, curiosity. Sometimes people feel like they've missed something, and so they want to delve into it. Another thing is some folks are looking for identity. Who am I? They want self-esteem. Uh, I ministered this year to a young man who uh, was so desirous of being liked and being appreciated that he ingratiated himself with every woman he could come across, not realizing how he was affecting it. And he got lots of, lots of ministry to his self-esteem that way. But uh, that's one thing that can lead us off. Escapism can lead us off. We just wanted to have something fun happen. Life is boring. Uh, we want to reduce tensions. We just want some excitement in life. We get rid of some of the pressures. And so we'll experiment with sex sometimes. Sometimes it's pure and simple rebellion. We don't want the church telling us what to do or the school telling us no hands on. And so we just want to outright rebel. And so when we find a chance, we'll do some excessive things. Sometimes it can even be to married people. Um, married folks will rebel against the impact of the mate. You can learn deviations also, and, and, and of course you can have satanic attack. And I want to just pause a minute with that concept of, of satanic attack. Now I put a word up here last week called savoring. I wish you'd write it down. <laughs> Because I really believe, my brethren, that this is something we all fall into without realizing it. I think God's Word teaches that we have one person that we're to have a sexual experience with, and one only. If we're not married, we hold that one in faith, even before we get there. I want to say it again. I believe God's Word teaches that we have one person we're supposed to have a sexual experience with. One and one only, our mate, our spouse. If we're made for marriage, and we'll know it by whether or not we're active in our think sexual thinking. Even if we're not married yet, I possess that future spouse in faith, okay? And I'm faithful to him. I'm faithful to her even before I get married, okay? I possess them in faith, and I possess my vessel in all honor. But that one. All right, and here's what happens lots of times. Somebody will come across our path. They have the right kind of personality. Uh, for a gal, it will be somebody that will make you feel warm. It will make you feel feminine. Uh, he'll make you feel secure. Uh, the, the relational thing, remember which we said is the biggie for most women? The relational thing will be there. You just enjoy his presence and not realizing that what you're enjoying is sexual titillation. And, and sisters, I want you to consider this. And I'm, I, have, I have two people that have, will, have, have volunteered. I didn't ask them. have volunteered to say something relative to this reality. I wish you would just... Would you want to come up or you want to talk back there? Come up. Uh, come up, would you? I'm going to ask my wife to come up. She's also she's a volunteer to say something about this business of savoring the sexual presence of someone. No touchies, just necessarily, just savoring their sexual presence, okay? Well, I was relating to uh, Brother Davis last week where he was talking about a woman being alone and uh, especially one that's been divorced. And then when she's uh, by herself, she's feeling rejection already. And a lot of the younger men feel that they're helping by showing her attention. Well, that's all right, except don't single yourself off to be the one to help this person. Because I was in that situation myself at one time. And... Uh, a younger man in the body 
kind of wanted to take me under wing. And he was a sweet brother in the Lord. And I loved him. But because of all of his attention, and uh, he took me and my children places. We never went anywhere alone. But even that, him being around so much, and he complimented me with things that I'd never heard before, you know. Um, my ex-husband never told me that I was a beautiful lady or anything like that. And this is what he would say. Well, those things meant a lot to me because I hadn't heard them. And through that, I interpreted his friendship for more. I wanted to think that he loved me and he was getting ready to ask me to marry him, which wasn't true. God had a whole different idea. Uh, I believe he was put in my life for a teaching because I learned a lot through that where I can help other women that come to me and tell me that they're, um, they're infatuated by a younger man and it's usually the looks plus what he says and uh, people, no matter whether you're in the Lord or not, you still look at the physical outward appearance. <coughs> and um, the Lord, the, uh, the person that I least expected to be my husband was put with me um, about a year, half a year later, and we were married. And we have a beautiful relationship, but it was put together by the Lord. I didn't put it together. And uh, this is why the younger men have to be careful, because women that have been rejected read a lot in to a situation that you mean nothing by having too many dinners at their house. Or it could even be with a girl that's had a relationship with another man that's lived with him, but has never married him. It's the same thing. And um, I thought if I could help any of you other younger men by telling you to be careful with a relationship with a woman, regardless of whether she's divorced or single, because a single person could react in the same way, take it as more than what you are intending it. Because you're vulnerable. Hold it just a minute. I want both of you to speak. Let them sit down. Thank you, sister. Appreciate it. I'm not sure that I... I'm not sure that I volunteered. <laughs> I think I was firmly persuaded into something that I'm not too sure I want to do. Um, I just want to say... Uh, a person doesn't have to be single or divorced to be vulnerable to the problem of savoring. And uh, this is something that I've had to struggle with. I, I will confess it because the scripture says if you confess your faults one to another and pray for one another, you'll be healed. And uh, so I'm not going to be afraid to uh, confess this vulnerability that I have. But the Lord's been showing to me uh, the root problem in my own life. And uh, it is the problem of a low self-image, a low self-concept. It's something that I've struggled with all of my life. Um, when you go back into your life and you realize that you've always been a shy person because you just don't want people to notice you, you're afraid that you will be rejected if you come out and be, and, and be a person that people can know. And um, so you kind of stay in the background and this is what I've done you know it's been my tendency all through my life I've stayed in the background and plus there's been other experiences in my life that have have reinforced that I was just thinking you know just the multiple things of how uh, growing up in a family with three aggressive brothers and uh, parents who always encouraged it, you're good if you're quiet and you don't you know <laughs> make a lot of noise and everything and, this is, this is how you're good. And so I was always rewarded for just being quiet and being in the background. 
And so as I grow older and begin to realize that the Lord cannot use you if you're in a shell. He can't minister through you if you're way down deep into a shell, you know, nice and comfortable down in there somewhere. And But as you start coming out of your shell, um, people start to notice you, and then you, you have a struggle in your mind of how you're going to receive their reaction to you. And um, uh, I'll just share um, uh, experience that I that of, of another person that I knew, a, a girl that I grew up with. She was the ugliest duckling. You just cannot, you know. I mean, she she never had a date through high school. She was always really ugly. Her, um, you know, she had a terrible self concept of, of herself. And as she grew older, uh, the Lord compensated for her faith by giving her a you know well built body and uh she started getting male attention and uh she just she just got to the point where she couldn't she couldn't handle it because it was ministering to her self concept her ego and finally she just came to the place where i mean she she had been married but this extra attention she was getting from other men um threw her to the point where she just she just fell into sin and ended up in divorce and remarriage. And uh, so anyway, uh, I just wanted to share one ver uh, two verses with you that have blessed my heart um, because I know that God is, He wants to minister to my self-image through what Christ is in me and the fact that God values me very, very much. And, and I am a, an important person to him, and I do not have to rely on um, the feedback that I get from other people to to build up my ego and to make me feel comfortable and comforted inside. You see, the thing of it is, when you grow up with your husband, and all you, the only male you've ever really related to and really known is your husband, you identify so closely with him that uh, when, when you start... For the first time in your life, getting feedback from other people, it, it, you know, you, you have to learn how to handle it. Um, but Psalm 139, uh, verse 17 and 18 says, How precious are also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. I don't know how many parents are in here. But I don't, as a parent, I, I like to just go and, and watch my children when they're sleeping. They're so precious to me. And when I think about God and how He thinks of me and how He looks at me, even when I'm sleeping, He's thinking of me. You know, I can be important to Him. And I don't have to, I can be strong inside. I don't have to rely on the, on the, the valuing of other people in my soul. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted you to see that that women are vulnerable, and for you know you have your own story, but you have your own vulnerability. The fellows are vulnerable, and we need to understand that there is this capacity to be to be vulnerable. Every relationship we have, and we take our sexuality with us. And um, I don't think that one of these ladies has expressed a vulnerability that each of us doesn't have. We're just made more vulnerable by certain experiences. And so Satan will attack us in our areas of greatest vulnerability. Isn't that right? Amen. And so sa satanic attack is a biggie. And uh, we just have to realize how we're affecting one another um, to keep from encouraging others to savor. Okay, now this concept of savoring, my brethren, I just want to uh, uh, give you a, a simple illustration. You ever had jelly in your mouth or a piece of candy and you put it under your tongue and you just let it... Let it stay there, you know, just want it to last as long as you can make it last. Well, this is what we're doing sometimes when we're around people that make us feel masculine, that make us feel feminine, that make us feel sexy, okay? There is a sexual titillation that we can get from certain other people. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, everybody had that experience. You, you enjoy the sexual presence of someone else. I want to submit to you that that savoring of anyone but your spouse is like Eve standing before the tree willing to consider the temptation. Are you hearing me? Okay. 
Now, I know this is going to take something out of some of your lives because a lot of you have, I know a lot of people have this, you have the habit of enjoying the sexual presence of other people. It feels good. I'm not doing anything wrong. But that's just like Eve, instead of walking past that tree and going on her way, she stood and was willing to consider. And brother, the scripture says, flee fornication. Flee youthful desire. And for you to enjoy the sexual presence of anybody but your spouse that you're either possessing in faith or, you know, your actual spouse because you're married, I just submit to you is tantamount to considering temptation. I just submit it. I don't say, thus saith the Lord, I just submit it. And I've dealt with hundreds of people who have had difficulties in this area. And without an exception, it all started, listen to me, it all started when one of them savored the sexual presence of the other. Are you hearing me? It starts with a savoring of the sexual presence of the other. You don't want to have your marriage, you get distracted by sexual problems, don't savor the sexual presence of anybody and you're all right. And I will t tell you, I will not allow myself to savor the sexual presence of any woman. A lot of beautiful women in this school, but I can't allow myself to savor the sexual presence of any woman except my wife. Can't do it, because it's tantamount to entertaining temptation. We can say, Lord, lead me not into temptation, but if we lead ourselves into it, we're tempting the Lord. Isn't that true? So I just submit that to you. It's not a popular teaching, but I just want you to consider it. Okay, now when we're ministering to people on sexual issues, and I'm about ready to wrap this up, first thing you have to do, my brethren, is examine your own heart. Make sure you're comfortable yourself. Okay? Don't minister to somebody on a sexual problem unless you yourself have been examined. Okay? Doesn't mean you're perfected, but you've examined yourself. Your own relationships first. Examine your own relationships first before you help somebody else with a sexual problem. First, your relationship with the Lord. Secondly, with your spouse or your, your anticipated spouse. With others and your own sexuality. You've got to be comfortable with your own sexuality before you can minister to somebody else and help them handle their own, their own sexuality. So, refer someone to someone else for counseling if you haven't worked this thing through yourself. Are you with me? If you're not comfortable with yourself, don't try to minister grace to others. You're not ready yet. Secondly, approach a counseling situation that has uh, sexual overtones the same way as you do any other counseling. L-U-V. Remember your acrostic? L-U-V. First make them feel loved, make them feel understood. Then you'll create a vulnerability. And that's Appendix Z in your, t in your textbook. Third. Third. Minister forgiveness. Make sure the Lord knows. But whatever the problem is, minister forgiveness. Promote sound attitudes and sound behavior. You've got to talk about the thing. Got to get it out. Be an example of the believers and, and, and be, be desensitized enough that you can talk about it. It's hard. If you haven't examined yourself, you're not going to be able to do it. But if you're comfortable with how God made you and you've worked some things through, you can minister grace. First, the Lord's forgiveness. Then talk about sensible attitudes, realistic attitudes, realistic behavior. Make sure they have accurate information. You'd be surprised how many people do not have accurate information about the sex act and, and, and the relationship. I'm going to get, on, get something on the board in just a minute that, uh, about that information. And then finally, be alert to give a referral. Don't you be so proud that you think you can't let this person get away from you unless you've helped them. I can't help a lot of people, and I refer them. The ones I can help, the ones I get a leading to help, I help. Those I can't, I refer, and I get other people that will minister with me. Okay, now I want to give you some real positive attitudes about sex. First of all, marriage sex is honorable. The marriage bed is honorable. Tim LaHaye and his wife wrote a book on the act of marriage, and they, they give a transliteration of Hebrews 13.4, and they say coitus is honorable in the marriage bed. That's the way they interpret it. Hebrews 13.4. But for sure, my brethren, marriage and sex act is honorable. In the marriage bed. Hebrews 13, 4. And I think sex is to be enjoyed. Proverbs 5, 18 and 19 and other references. But sex can and I believe should be enjoyed. Proverbs 5, 18 and 19. I think the scriptures also teach that it's to be an investment when you're married. In each other regularly. Regularly. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 5. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 5. Sex, a regular investment in one another. The only time, the only exception is when you, by mutual agreement, take time off for prayer. 
Okay? But in marriage, it's a regular investment. Some people have called it a sacrifice under the Lord. Um, a sacrifice of celebration of one's relationship. I, there are all kinds of, of illustrations like that. But at the very least, bottom line is that it's to be regularly invested in except uh, planning ahead of time for prayer. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 5. The husband and the wife are not to hold back from one another. It's not to be held back to. You give yourselves freely to one another. A bunch of references. This needs to be seen. Matthew 19, 4 through 6. Matthew 19, 4 through 6. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 9. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 9. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8. 1 Thess 4, 1 through 8. Another thing I need to point out, that sex sin in the scripture, sexual sin, is called two things. Number one, it's called attractive, but at the same time it's called destructive and foolish. Sexual sin is attractive. Sex sin is attractive. It's described that way in the word of God. But it's also called self-destructive and foolish. References, Proverbs 5, 1 through 11, plus verse 20. Plus verse 23. Proverbs 5, 1 through 11, 20 and 23. Proverbs 6, 23 through 33. 6, 23 through 33. Proverbs 7, 5 through 27. Proverbs 7, 5 through 27 and others. Okay, now this is going to be the last day we talk about this except for questions. And I have to show you a couple more things. Now, my brethren... You have to have wisdom, and I want to ask you to pray about this as we talk about some of these things on the board. Father, give us your wisdom in your mind as we approach some of these bus this, this, this business of, of sex in the marriage bed. Lord, we've got single men and women here. I pray that you'll give grace to keep their hearts with all diligence. Right of it are the issues of life. Lord, this is the place where we must deal with it. Give us your mind so we can help others as well as ourselves be helped in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, we come against any distracting spirit of Satan. I command you to leave us alone and let us concentrate on what God wants us to concentrate on here. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, now, in the marriage relationship, I just want to talk about this briefly. It's not a real heavy thing, but I want to get it across to you. There are, there's a lot of haste because fellas very quickly get turned on. And if you were to graph it, it would be like that. They very quickly get turned on. The sight of my wife, the touch of my wife, and I'm ready for action. Now, that's not atypical. That's normal. Ready for action. Ready to perform. Right here. Okay? There's an erection. I'm ready to perform. And if I have the opportunity, I will. Okay? If it's appropriate, I will. And I very quickly, uh, uh, besides being stimulated very quickly, I very quickly am satisfied in a matter of seconds. And as soon as I am satisfied, I crash. Now, there is the pattern of a sexual stimulus and response for a man. Okay? I want to show you what the problem is in a marriage. A woman, let's say this is the point where she, uh, the, 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 there's the possibility of an encounter. A woman very slowly gets turned on, okay, compared to a man. Now we're talking about maybe the space of 10 to 15 minutes for some women. It can be longer, it can be a little shorter. The women take a long time to get really ready for a physical encounter, for the intercourse. Now if you're married, men, do you see what your propensity is? quickly get with it and get done, right? And the woman needs foreplay. And fellas, if you love that woman, minister to her before you go to the bed, okay? Before you have coitus, give her time to get built up and come to a point of full appreciation for the, for the sex act. Okay, now, just as, let's say, a woman can reach coitus here, and incidentally, it's a lot harder for women, many women, to reach that state of orgasm. That's the word, that, that, that feeling of, of completeness. But just like a woman takes a long time to get up, a woman takes a long time to come down. Okay? And fella, if you love her, you stay with her. You don't go to the refrigerator just as soon as it's all over. You don't <laughs> say, honey, nice seeing you. We'll see you again. Uh, and get about your business. It's a temptation. Now, we laugh, especially if singles don't realize that this is going to be seen over and over again. And fellas, if you love like you've been loved, you love your wife like Christ loves the truth, you stay with that woman and you stay with her and you'll learn to discipline your own passion. Okay? So that you can get that woman to be able to appreciate the full encounter. And then after the full encounter, you stay with her until she has relaxed and is ready to leave too. Are you hearing me? Okay, that's an important thing and I needed to have brought it up. 
Many, many marriage problems are because of what we call premature ejaculation. Many gals get discouraged because they can't come to an orgasm because a guy doesn't really take time to love her and to build her up, to meet her needs. Now, there are some things that, that, that can get into the way. I said, number one, there can be misinformation. And I do recommend that you get your facts straight before you get into a marriage relationship. It's one of the reasons why we uh, do encourage you to get some premarital counseling. I really think that it takes more to get a driver's license than it does to get married. And there's a whale of a lot more consequence to getting married and having children. And I would require people to go to, if I had the opportunity, a sizable experience in premarital counseling. Okay, so you need the right information. You can get that out of books. You can get that from uh, personal counseling uh, or from classes. But you need good information. Second, another thing that can cause difficulties in marriage. This is it. We're not going to talk about sex anymore unless you've got a special question. But fatigue, haste, and lack of, of opportunity. Those are the two big biggies. We get tired. And listen, it's just not only the gal that doesn't that has a headache when she comes home at night. The guy can also be tired. Fatigue, haste. We just talked about haste, which is a very common thing. Haste. And what was the other thing I just said? Um, oh, yeah, opportunity. You got a bunch of kids. It's very difficult to have time alone, except maybe late at night or very early in the morning when you want to have time with the Lord. Okay? It's just really tough. And brother, brother and sister, you got to make opportunity for yourselves. Okay? Have time to make out after you get married. After you get married, God does not expect you to do it before you get married. Okay, you don't need time to stimulate one another. Doing foreplay before you get married, brethren, is a tough thing. Look what you're doing when you're sitting there petting. What are you doing? You're getting her all hot and bothered. You're getting her all lathered up for a sexual experience that God doesn't want you to have. And you'll either sin or hurt yourself by taking yourself into a tension-producing situation that will transfer right on into marriage. And when you do have marriage, she'll be so tight and tense about the relationship that she'll have a hard time relating to and releasing and enjoying a sexual encounter. Hear me. I know wherever I speak. Don't fiddle around with petting. It's intended for marriage. It's foreplay. Keep your hands off one another unless you're ready for marriage. And you say, well, it's hard to do. It's easier for you to talk. Yeah, it's easier for me to talk than for you to perform. I buy that. But I'm, I'm giving you a fair warning. Okay? Because you're going to hurt yourself otherwise. And a lot of knowing nod. I don't think anybody would disagree. Sister, I just want to finish this up real quick. The haste thing is this thing, premature ejaculation. Don't get in too big a hurry. A woman needs plenty of time to relate. And she needs things right. Women need freedom from distraction. Women need a lot of kids that could possibly enter in. You need a lock on that door. Okay? You'd be surprised how many times I've been able to help resolve a marriage conflict by just suggesting a lock on the door. So the wifey doesn't have to worry about maybe being interrupted. Okay? She needs peace and quiet. Things need to be right. You may have to plan ahead. I know a brother, he was Roussel, he was uh, Castagno's predecessor. He was only with me for a couple of months. But Roussel said he took his wife out every single week and went to a motel together. Well, they got their kids raised, but they got into the habit. It's just to get away in a new situation. Stimulated that relationship, okay? This is part of it. Find opportunity. You need to do it maybe when you've got kids. And I know it's hard to, to, to find the, um, the money to do it, but there are ways. And fatigue. Save time for each other. With me, take Time for your husband. If you possibly can, learn to pace yourself through the day so you got a little extra energy for your hubby when he gets home at night. Or get up a little bit early. Go to bed earlier so you can get some time. You've got to take time for each other. Okay, another thing that causes difficulties in marriage is boredom. A lot of times things get very common. You know, you have a good relationship to your spouse and you can actually just plain get old-fashioned, get bored with the same old thing. All You need to learn how to take people out. That's one of the good reasons for going out to dinner. So you don't get bored with one another. It can be distracting. But few cultural norms, there are some anxieties that are caused sometimes by the group you're running with, some freedom. I, I find it personally threatening if everybody is around my wife and me hugging us all the time. I don't enjoy it, okay? Not that I don't enjoy a hug, but I do know myself and I know my wife. You heard her express her vulnerability, her distractibility. Okay, I don't like it all the time. And in some situations you get around, everybody's got to do the huggies. That isn't edifying to me. And uh, there may be some cultural things in your situation uh, where you may have to say, I'm going to have to stand against the cultural norm. And I know somebody says, if I would just really get filled and stay filled, I would enjoy the huggies. But I'm trying to tell you there are some, there's some sexual factors that we need to consider. And my wife is not a bad person. She's not wicked. Okay? And I'm telling you, if you go around hugging her as a fella, she's going to have to work not being distracted. I'm going to tell you something else. I made out of the same kind of stuff. And a cute little gal like you come around and you give me a hug sometime, I'm going to get distracted. Now, we're not wicked people. We're trying to do the best we can. And we're not unspirit-filled. 
I just want to submit that to you. May the Lord moderate our cultural norms. I don't think I'm not against hugs. I think under the under the anointing of the Spirit, they're wonderful, and I have I have initiated them. Okay, two more points. Physical problems. I want to give them to you. Can inter, can interfere with a marriage relationship. Obesity, glandular disturbances, diabetes, low energy level. I think I might have hit this before. Also, when women have babies, their muscles get weakened in the vagina. And weakened muscles make it difficult to, to institute the kind of vaginal sex that they had before they had all the children. The more children, the weaker sometimes those muscles get. And that can lead to other complications. So I want you to know those problems are there. How you deal with them, maybe you won't be able to. You may have to refer them. Okay, one more thing that can disturb a marriage relationship is using sex as a weapon. Women will uh, keep sex back and men will be aggressive and demand sex, okay? And you can abuse one another with sex. And I think God has to give us the grace not to do that. But we've covered off way of a lot of ground in just one more period. And I may have left you with some misunderstandings, and I hope we can allow some time for correction. Our Father, we pray that you'll help us to keep our hearts with all diligence. Lord, that's a need in our lives, especially we who are unmarried. We may have difficulties. Pray, Lord, that you'll give us that grace. And we pray, Father, that we'll realize that there are ways to improve even a good relationship. Help us, Father, to grow in our understanding and grow in our tenderness and appreciation of one another. Help us to love each other like we've been loved. And that means, Lord, that we won't take from others. We won't extract from others, but we will give ourselves as a living sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.